You're listening to Earnestly Speaking, the only weekly podcast that covers friends, foes, and anything that goes. And now, for your badass host, Ernest Owens. And we're back for another episode of Earnestly Speaking with your host, Ernest Owens, myself. (laughs) What a week, okay? What a week. It has been a week over here. I <sighs> I know a lot of you all are like, listen, they know. Y'all see it. Y'all see it. It's been action-packed. I had to take a little sip of my recess. I am loving recess, y'all. Th- these are my favorites. I am drinking the peach ginger flavor, and it is so good. Let me take a sip. Mm. I am still on my sparkling water crusade. My mom, we was talking about sparkling water like the other day, and she was just like, you know, trying to figure out which one she liked. Now, I I love Spindrift, but she is, like, indifferent on it. But she only had one flavor of Spindrift. She had the raspberry lime flavor, and I think that was a little too much for her. I I told her, grapefruit. If you're into sparkling water and you're going through the Spindrift era, you know, start with grapefruit and then work your way down, personally. The limes, the citrus are very good. But she had the raspberry lime. I think she was expecting something different because she's also, you know, anti-pop as well. That's why we look so fabulous because we're we're, we're drinking sparkling water. You know, we don't drink coffee. Um, You know, we're really good on that. And I think that's, you know, i am just really been into my, you know, my my wellness. So very much into that. Um, Yeah, but I love recess, sparkling water, you know, zero cal. Well, they have a couple of calories, not too much, like what, 20 calories, 15 calories. Barely any carbs, just good, just good, just a good replacement to to pop. I just can't with pop. I, I just can't. I, I'm trying. I mean, the teeth is looking right. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, I just mm-mm. avoid it at all costs. I know sometimes I have a little ginger ale bite in me, but mm-mm. so this has been a week. I, I mean, you got Phillies versus Astros. I'm just gonna say this. I have been very quiet about this. People have asked my position because you know I'm from Houston. And then, of course, I live in Philly now. So people are like, what do you feel about Astros or Phillies? I will just say that, um, you know, I know it's, 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 it's this weekend they were tied. You know, Astros had the first win. I mean, I'm sorry. Phillies had the first win. Astros had the next win. You know, honestly, I, I don't have a dog in this race. But one thing I will say is that maybe I'm in for the Astros slightly because I, I'm, I'm annoyed with the Phillies fans and how they've been showing their asses already. I mean, the first day, when they got into the World Series, what, a week ago, they were climbing up poles, cutting up, acting the food. The fans got on got on my nerves. They were mad because I was talking about the racial double standards. And they just got on my nerves. And so, honestly, to protect the city and not, you know, have to deal with all the shenanigans and the, and the crowds and the parades and stuff, honestly, I, I, don't, I don't really want the Phillies to win whatever we can y'all can disagree with me it's fine it's okay we it's sports it's not like you know it's i don't know the environment (laughs) or this upcoming midterm race that everyone should be actually worried about more people are investing in this fucking phillies game than i think november 8th so honestly i don't care i really don't i don't whatever go astros (laughs) because let me tell you as a houstonian i don't recall uh astros fans tearing up the city i i don't know that is such, I'm sorry, Caucasians, y'all can have it. That is a very Caucasian thing. Tearing up your neighborhoods and streets when you win, okay? Emphasis on the when you win, right? You're tearing up your own communities when you win, <laughs> okay? Activists and folks tearing up communities because of systemic injustice, because those neighborhoods are being neglected and not being treated properly as a way to to demand change. Th- that's what that's what others do. You all do the opposite. You have nice areas, okay? You're on Broad, you're on Rittenhouse, and you're tearing up Center City. You're, you're climbing on the poles. And then the cops will take you down and y'all giving each other hugs and rooting each other on. And then you got Fox News, these people talking about something. It's so peaceful, peaceful protest day, a peaceful celebration. That's a peaceful celebration? Let me go in my office and and try to climb up on a table and jump and do, and do, that's peaceful? Okay. All I'm just saying is the rules are different. White people move the goalpost on it, okay? Y'all don't care. Y'all don't care. Been knew that since the Eagles. So quite frankly, no, no, lose this, lose. 
so that we don't have to have this shit. But if y'all do win, if the Phillies win, you know, it is what it is, right? It is what it is. If they win, I mean, we're going to really see the d- destruction. See, the 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 little where it made it to the World Series, that was light. That was light. That was a little sample. But if they actually win, okay, Philly. <laughs> But I'm I'm sorry. I just go ahead, Astros. Plus, the person over the Astros, he's black. It's a black coach. He's going to the World Series five times. So, shout out to Dusty. Shout out to Dusty. That's all I'm saying. I, I got you know. I'm just saying. It'd be nice to see a brother, you know, coach on a baseball team win a win a win a, win a World Series. So, and I know everybody talking about oh Astros cheated. They the cheating the Astros back in the day. I don't care. I don't care. I mean, honestly, th- that's not why the Phillies are struggling. The Phillies are struggling because I don't think they're as focused. I mean, there's little, there, you know, the, that 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 first game went on hella long. I mean, they were tied up till midnight. It was wild. But like, all I gotta say is, I, I just, I don't know. I don't know. I don't care. <laughs> but I want to put that there. Speaking about things. So I got my gold tail far back. It finally came in. And it is beautiful. I'm holding it right now. It's so pretty. Oh my goodness. It is like so beautiful. It's gold. It's, it's the hue is so good that it's it's actually giving a rose gold look, which I love. It's shimmery, it's shiny. You know, gold is my favorite color, and it's just marvelous. I love this bag. So shout out to the to tail far bag coming in on time. It's a perfect fall bag. I'm feeling golden. It's been a golden year. It's been a golden hour. Loving it. So I have plans. So this this Sunday, I did not do. I know a lot of y'all was asking about, you know, what 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 this not this weekend's edition of it's not a it's not a restaurant. It's my home. It was it did not happen this weekend because I had dinner with the lieutenant governor, the next lieutenant governor of Pennsylvania, hopefully. Austin Davis. It was lovely. Met with his people. We had dinner at my favorite restaurant Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and had some really good conversations about black journalism and and this election, and, and you know some real important conversation. It was a it was a very memorable dinner for sure. And that's all I'm going to say on it. Moving along, but let me just say this though: Friday, Saturday, Sunday, every time Chad Williams never misses. I'm sorry, it, he never misses. He never misses. That man is phenomenal. That food is always incredible. That tasting menu is not for the meek. I'm going to say this real quick. If you're somebody, listen, if you got a lot of dietary restrictions and allergies and things, they do accommodate that Friday, Saturday, Sunday. But I just want to be clear and say to people that if you got a ton of restrictions, if are, are these restrictions or are these preferences? Because let me just say this. Chad will make you be a believer in things that you may have not thought you would be a fan of. Certain vegetables and spices and herbs, you might not like it somewhere else, but when Chad do it, you, you, you appreciate what he's doing it conceptually with the food. I just think sometimes people go to restaurants, they'll make it seem like they're allergic to everything. It's like, are you allergic or you just don't prefer it? Because don't, don't, don't mix up the dinner for everybody because you got some things, you some hangups on stuff. You know, just... I always tell people that like allergies and preferences are two different things. And that's why I've become a good foodie because I will come in mentally with some preferences. And then really in reality, I just got to let the chef do what they do. When people say stuff like they don't like spicy food, don't go to an Indian restaurant. Don't go to an Indian restaurant if you don't like spicy food. Like to try to make a restaurant alternate its actual identity. It's just weird to me. Like, don't go to a seafood restaurant and say you don't like seafood. Then don't go. You can't go to Vernick Fish. You just can't go. You don't like seafood. You can't go. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's, 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 it's interesting uh, in, in the foodie world how that's been. But I have been really loving and supporting my Black-owned businesses this week. I love, there's so much. Philadelphia's dining scene is coming back and reimagining itself. There's just a lot of great, I'm feeling good. I mean, I mean, of course, Friday says Sunday's a black owned restaurant, but also there is the return. I mean, the final, actually the final reveal of honeysuckle provisions. Okay. 
Omar Tate, the incredible chef Omar Tate, who's been on great TV shows, Food Network, James Beer. I mean, he's everywhere, right? This man is a rock star. His wife, Sybil, they have a grocery in West Philly on 48th and Spruce. It's called Honeysuckle Provisions. It is a concept from Tate's original Honeysuckle's uh, tasting um, experience he was doing. This is an Afrocentric grocery store. It's a grocery store, but it's also food. They sell breakfast and lunch. They're open Wednesdays through Sundays, okay? So they're off on Mondays and Tuesdays from 8 a.m., to 5 p.m. It's pretty good hours. So you can slide in and get some breakfast before noon or you can come in and get lunch. I live in West Philadelphia. It is not too far from where I live. And I am just excited about this place. I went to the grand opening on Sunday. I mean, it's not Sunday. Saturday was the grand opening and it was phenomenal. They have a menu, right? They have this crazy... It's just so good. It's beautiful. It smells good. They sell incense, honeysuckle incense. Mr. Johnson has been into incense in the house. I've been loving it. It was, oh, it's been phenomenal. So some of the things I had off the menu, they make these homemade like part tarts that are like with these unique space flavors. Everything is like really done like organically and very ingredients driven. It's very raw, fresh. He's all about nourishment. He wants to create food with whole foods and ingredients and, and special ingredients. He's making everything fresh. It's made with love. Everything is just done to the utmost level. It's so good. It's so earthy. He has vegan options. Everything he he does has this like arc of like you can do a vegan version or non-vegan version. All of his salads have the option of chicken or salmon, not as an add-on, but just already prorated into the, the, the deal, which is phenomenal. Um, he has, what did I have? He had the dollar hoagie, which isn't a dollar, but it's called a dollar hoagie. Oh my God, that hoagie was I'm still savoring it. The bread, the everything. It was an incredible hokey. He has um, jerk beef, beef patties, but he also has a vegan option. Um, he has yams he sells. He sells, um, I had a bunch of things off that damn menu. Coconut yogurt. It was fresh, organic. Um, he makes these coconut yogurt parfaits. He makes uh, these sweet cakes. I mean, it's just so much good stuff. Fresh, fresh. That's the best way to describe it. And he has this mini store which has like all these really great organic fresh vegetables um, that are and, and just really great fresh produce and drinks and juices. He sells um, condiments and different little things that like like homemade condiments and relishes and all types of different cool stuff, fresh eggs, all these really cool things. And what I love about that is that, you know, in West Philly, there's pockets of West Philly and throughout Philadelphia that are food deserts. And food deserts are places where I think a mile radius of access to fresh fruit and vegetables. There are areas in this town that like literally do not have access. Like people do not have a walking distance to get fresh produce. It's a shame. And this has been going on in Philadelphia forever, for years. And I've written about it before, about like these conversations about healthy eating. It's like, are you making these these items accessible like you could go to ridden house and have a farmer's market every damn week with, with with farm fresh whole foods and vegetables right there right there in the middle of ridden house square right tons of grocery stores that sell produce and then there's parts of west philly north philly where it's just dry food deserts it's disgusting the only thing that's there is corner stores and and, and, and what they call poppy stores that sell junk food and pizza and stuff like and he's putting this in the middle of a neighborhood this is very intentional this is very deep i i'm i, I i'm a i'm a huge fan you know i love the idea that i could walk you know, a few blocks or whatever and, and get a shallot without having to go to Whole Foods. He's got shallots and ginger and, you know, collard greens and things. And I'm just like, this is dope. This is what community cooperative eating looks like. It's just such a woke concept. He sells really great food cookbooks from black authors. His staff is is black and brown people. It's all diverse. It's so inclusive. It's so Afrocentric, so intentional. The ingredients, the food, it's unapologetic. And I love it. Support it. I, I give it five stars. It just, I walked in there, I was like, take my money. Take all of my money. I, I love it. I, if I, if I, I mean, we got to keep this place alive. And it's, it's, it's doing really well. When I went in there, I, I went around one o'clock on this grand opening and it was packed. I mean, people were just in there. 
Um, we got to spread the word. On my Instagram, I, I've never, I've praised a lot of things, but I really love what, what Omar Tate and his wife is doing. Uh, they're a beautiful black couple, black love. I mean, everything about it is just a godsend. A godsend. Mwah. Chef Kiss, I highly recommend it. 10 out of 10. 11 out of 10. Everyone deserves to go there. Just go there. Buy vegetables. Try this food. Embrace the food. Love the culture. One thing he has that got me excited is that on Thursdays, he does $1 chicken, fried chicken. And his and if anybody's been following Omar Tate, his fried chicken is incredible. He gives two pieces for a dollar on Thursdays only. So this is helping me with my... I'm breaking my addiction. I'm I'm close to two months, y'all, sober from food apps. Okay, November first will mark two months of me being two months sober from food apps. It has been wonderful. I have struggled sometimes at lunchtime. Dinner, I cook dinner fine, but lunch it gets a little hard because I'm like, okay, oh, this would be that time where I could order something. Now I have a place where I could just walk couple of blocks, take that cute little walk in the sunshine, get some vitamin D or whatever, and go right in and just order me whatever from there and feel good about the food. The prices are very reasonable, not overpriced. They got all the items, most of the items, I think everything's under $20, under $15. They got stuff for even under five. I mean, it's very reasonable priced. Like he, he made this for black people. It's right now it's takeout. There's no dining in. Go in, get your food, do your thing. I just love it. Just just cannot speak more highly of it. Um, yeah, so I love it. So other restaurants I went to, I went to Alexander's, which replaced V Street. Now, it's not black owned, but the head chef there in Montana and, and, and Jameer, who is the sous chef, they're like young as hell. He's 26-year-old black sous chef, and the other chef is Montana, who's, his, I believe, in his early 30s. He is the, the lead chef there at Alexander's. It is incredible there. Um, they replaced... Uh, v Street that used to be right there next to Zuma. So all my people that's around 19th and Rennen House, that whole area, this restaurant is there. It's been a hit. I went there for brunch. Y'all saw the pictures. Brunch there was phenomenal. Highly recommend it. Loved it. Um, and then I went to Gabriella's uh, Vietnam, which is not black owned. It's Asian owned. Uh, they're Vietnamese. And Gabriella's Vietnam, Vietnamese was a VYOB. This is the last weekend they were BYOB. So the restaurant is incredible. Y'all saw the food on my Instagram. They got some water fern open dumplings that are just sensational. The presentation is top tier. They have some wings, some honey, soy, uh, I think it's ginger, soy, garlic wings. That shit was hidden. And they have a phenomenal marinated beef dish. We had that with some jasmine rice. That shit popped. Everything in there was good. I, I was like, wow. And I haven't gone, I, I hadn't had a reason to go, but I'm going to dinner with a friend and it was, it was a great dinner. It was phenomenal. We were, I was personally celebrating something that happened Friday night, which we'll get to later on in this podcast. But you know, let me tell you, it was, it was one for the books, right? It was one for the record books. And Lip Brothers World, because everyone's been asking, Lip Brothers been going out. We went to uh, Old Bar. I will tell you all that I've been having this uptick in liking oysters. It's been a theme. I know I've talked about it in previous podcasts. The oysters at Old Bar for happy hour were divine, memorable. I like my oysters fat and thick. Anyway, um, they, they were really good. The oysters are really good. And... You know, people say just like, no, because that oyster smell fishy and you don't want. Anyway, those oysters were divine. They were very, uh, the happy hour deal was was solid. They got $6 cocktails. You know, let me tell you about these happy hours. A lot of these happy hours are trying to push cocktails after $10 on a happy hour menu. How do you have happy hour drinks that are more than $10? The point of happy hour is to be under 10 bucks. In my opinion, you should not be paying over $10 for a happy hour cocktail. People will say, Ernest, what are you talking about? No, I'm real. I remember, let me go, let me see, I'm, I'm aging myself. About, about 10 years ago, because I was 21, 10 years ago, so I was able to legally drink. Back in the day, happy hour drinks for $5 or less. And, you know, nowadays... Happy hour drinks are like nine bucks and ten bucks now. It's very seldom you can find one around the five dollar range. Well, Obar has 
specialty cocktails at six bucks and whatnot. And not just the little well drink, little, you know, cranberry vodka johns. They have actual cocktails that they're they're selling in punches. Now, a lot of people get away with punches. They're they're pushing punches, which I don't mind. If you have a good strong punch, I'll drink it, right? But a lot of people are doing that now in the food scene. I'm noticing that in the in the culture is that they're like now creating a punch or something that they put as their happy hour drink. I'll take it. I'll drink the whole gallon because like to me, happy hour should be that way. Now, what they're doing, what restaurants are doing too, is that they're making the cocktail like 10 bucks, but then they're making the wines and beers a little less. But I don't go to happy hour for beer. I don't drink beer at all, by the way. But I don't go to happy hour for wine either, personally. I feel like, I don't know. As I guess I'm talking from a privileged perspective because my house got a whole little damn wine celery. So I'm just like, I just, my house got a whole everything. But if I'm going to happy hour, especially being married to a man who bartends my mindset is that the 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 i need to try something original if i wanted to get vodka cranberry for four dollars i could literally go home like i have happy at my house now like i have friends come over now we 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 have after parties at the crib we was out the lip brothers was out we was at the go um our good girlfriend sharon was with us we went out barry was there mr johnson and we got together and, um, you know, had a good time. Now, let me tell you something. I was going to roll up on, on on somebody from Fox. Now, w- this is all the good humor. So before y'all get messy and start doing the whole, ooh, well, there's a little ooh, but let me tell you. So, Mr. Johnson, yours truly, Bartender Barry, he does Fox segments. He goes on Fox 29 a couple in the afternoons in the morning. I mean, a morning show. Uh, some, you know, he's done it with Alex. He's done it with Mike Jarek. He's, he does it often. And so, you know, it's always a moment when he goes on. And that's the only time I really watch the show. Now, people tell me the morning show is good. I, I don't really watch local TV like that. I know. I'm a journalist. I should. I, I I do watch, like, certain clips and things sometimes. But I'm not really into local news, personally. Not local TV news. Not the late night crime shit. I just can't with it. I love my friends who are in the broadcast business. But... I, I tell them sometimes, like, y'all, y'all got to find a way. You know, like, I like Telemundo. Let me tell you something. I wish I knew Spanish because Telemundo, they be killing over there. You know, a um, couple of good, I got some good friends uh, and some good folks, peers that's at Telemundo. Now, they get all the Emmys, the regional Emmys, and they, and, that, and and their stuff be good. Now, I like I like what they're doing over there at NBC10 with, with Telemundo. That be hidden. I don't know the Spanish, but I, I feel, I find myself more interested in the news with those anchors. They got flavor. They got energy. They got, they, they're, they're talented at what they do. Now, the rest of these non-Spanish speaking anchors, Philly, it's hit or miss. You know, everybody can't be a Christy Aletto at 6ABC or Rick Williams, right? You know, I'm just, I'm just telling y'all, you know, everybody can't be a Sherry, right? Uh, Williams like it's 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 not that a lot of these people don't have the range sometimes okay and then the ones who are really great like Alicia um she then went over to New York from CBS3 my good Judy love her won an Emmy recently love her I just like I I'm very selective about it now people ask me what I think about that morning show Fox me nine I'm gonna be respectful because y'all because y'all like y'all like to be messy I'm just saying that mm, I'll just say this no, <laughs> I'm not going to say that. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. I'm going to talk about things in a metaphorical way. Not necessarily speak about any morning show. I'm just talking in general. I'm saying I think that a format can be great, but sometimes people can outgrow a format. And and that, that goes for me. I, I've had... Things that I felt like, you know what, Ernest, it's time to grow up and evolve. You did just really well at one point. Now it's time to elevate what you do. You need to step it up. And I and I have those conversations with real mentors and myself. You should not be having professional conversations with every random person. I hate that. I hate when people who are not in my respective field or in my industry, my space, like to try to give me, you know, I mean, I listen to some feedback, right? Like community input on stories, absolutely. But like career decisions, I don't take that from everybody. There's people that always be like, you should be on TV. You should go to CNN. And I was like, if you only knew the shit that was going on at CNN, you would never recommend me for it. And I knew 
what was going on at CNN before the public knew. Now everybody know what's going on at CNN. And like, ooh, Ernest, you dodged a bullet. I couldn't dodge a bullet. I was ever, I was, I was ever in the room to get shot with. How about that? I, I, I know a lot of things that sometimes people speak for me, and I'm like, you're not in the industry, and there's no disrespect, but you got to see some stuff play out. There's a reason why your fave was not at CNN. There's a reason why your fave was not the New York Times. There's a reason why I choose not to work for a lot of these media companies. There's a reason why I'm not at BET. There's a reason why I'm not working full time for any of these places because there's so much shit I know that happens to other black people. And they will tell me, bro, don't, it's not for you. Don't do it. Not your voice. They'll, they'll stifle your voice. I've been I've been saved from a lot of bad decisions in my career because I've listened to my other peers and have listened to others in the industry put me on. And I've been very grateful for that because a lot of times people will think, oh, they hate and they trying to hold you back. No, nah, there were people that was looking out for me and was like, if you go here, this will happen because I'm seeing what's happened to some of my peers in the industry that I look up to and I like that have went into those full time industry jobs and things and, and, and the stuff that they have to fight for and deal with. I don't got time to be fighting. To be a black journalist, to be a black queer journalist, to be a young, bright, brilliant, young black queer journalist is enough work within itself. To have to then deal with microaggressions in the newsrooms and all this other shit just adds layers to it. So personally, I can't. But back on to the T because I know y'all looking like, okay, that's nice, but but what was that shade you had to say about Fox Me Not? No, it's not shade. All I'm going to say is, is that when you've been in a particular format for so long, you should be trying to evolve past it. You should do things in a period. Everything is a period. And then eventually you say, okay, it's time for me to evolve and to do something different. I mean, I was the LGBTQ uh, editor at Philly Mag. It was, it was a fabulous experience. But I was ready to do something else. I, I had covered Gabriel Racing for several years. I was ready to evolve. You just have to always find ways to challenge yourself and evolve. Or it feels like you're stagnant or it feels like a broken record. That's all I'm going to say. That, that's, that's what I'll say about it. But, but what happened in this particular situation, which I will speak on because it was public. In the segment where Barry is doing one of his cocktails, he was doing that, uh, that trend. I forget that little... Uh, Fabiago, Fabi it was the from Game of Thrones. I don't know what the hell this drink is, but everybody loves it. It's like this really fancy drink with like prosecco and it's Italian and it's like a sprazzato or something like that. Something like that. It's like a Negroni, but it's like a special Negroni. I can't describe. It's like a Negroni with 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 with, with uh, prosecco in it. I, I anyway, he was there to to do a demo for this trendy drink, and in the scene with garnish, he had time and some other things. Well. I didn't pick up what Mike Jerry had said because he talked really fast, but he threw a swig of time at Barry, like, live on air. And everyone saw it and was like, yo, what's up with him? Why did he throw that at him? Like, that's wild. Well, what he said in, in his breath when he was talking was like, want to see time fly? And then he threw it fast. So he was talking about time, but like making a corny dad joke. It was a bad dad joke, right? And so, want to see time fly? And he through the time, the time was going to go fly. Not funny, not cute, corny as hell. Well, anyway, everyone was buzzing about this when they saw it, was messaging me like, yo, what's up with that? And I was like, I don't know what was that, but I had, you know, spoke to Mr. Charles. He was just like, I was not prepared for that. And I had to keep a straight face. And I was like, yeah, because, you know, <laughs> like, what are we doing here? You on live TV throwing time at a young black, like, come, Mike. Now, I know Mike like black women, okay? He does like black women. But, you you can't be throw you can't be out here throwing time at the brothers now. You you can't just be out here just throwing time at people. Literally and figuratively. Okay? Like you cannot just be doing that. Especially when it's like we on TV and this is perfect. Like, that's not cute. Not cute. But I saw him at Fago. I didn't bring it up to him. I just saw him. I just well, it was it was an open bar. Let's just start there. I was I was just it was fun. It was fine. It's no real hard feelings, by the way. So don't, you know, I know how y'all get. Okay, let me just say this. Ernest stands. This is not a time to attack. Do not go out. Don't. This is not a real issue. I'm just sipping. I wouldn't even call it venting. I'm just calling it sipping. I'm sipping on something that I have observed. But anyway, it was, we was at Fago. The boys was there, George and uh, Jamarcus and us. And, and we all went out and had drinks at a good time. It was a nice time. We loved it to death. Now, I will say this, and then we'll move on to these hot topics, because a lot of shit has went down this week. Okay? 
the book is coming, as you know. I have pretty much finalized the grand opening of the book. I am going to be doing something. I'm doing a tour. Okay, I'll just say it for you all on this podcast. There will be a book tour. I'll just save all of the bells and whistles and mastermind. There will be a book tour. There are some dates. There's something on the West Coast that's being worked on. There's stuff on the um the the, the East Coast. There's stuff going to be working. There are some confirmed dates and locations. I cannot disclose those dates and locations yet, but there it will be a book tour. There's enough cities and things that I can now feel comfortable saying that word. At first, I was like, I know to say a tour, it can't just be like one place, right? It's got to be multiple places. So there will be a book tour. Stuff is coming together really, 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 really well. The big launch will be in Philadelphia on Tuesday, February 21st. Now, this big launch event is a really like a private event, um, but there will be some some top people invited. I will also do a special event for the fans in Philly. For folks who was not invited to that, that's not a part of that mix. There'll be an open public event um, that I'm going to open up with what I call for the fans. And that event will be happening as well. Um, there'll be multiple opportunities to get your book signed. There'll be opportunities to get signed copies. I promise you. I will sign every book. I actually am going to do something else because I saw Jamel Hill just do this. She followed another journalist who did this. But Jamel Hill has been going to airports, writing notes and books and autographing books and hiding them in different places and telling people to go on social and tell her. Look, I don't know if I got that kind of Jamel Hill pull, but I will be autographing books in random places throughout Philadelphia for sure. Maybe other cities, but definitely in Philadelphia, specifically at Barnes & Noble. And a pen bookstore. I'll be going to some places and like writing notes, uh, like like Dear Reader and writing cute notes and autographing it. And if you just so happen to pick up the book and see that it was autographed by me, get it. So I'll be doing that kind of stuff. I am all about that. I will be writing and autographing books um, at certain stores so you can just find it and just grab it and get lucky and get you a special copy. I won't do it to all the books because some people may not may not want an autograph book or maybe they want to they want me to autograph it to them in person. But I will be doing surprise pop ups like that throughout. Just be prepared for that. Um, other than that, yeah, that, that I mean, I there that's all I can say for now. But I feel comfortable. The place and venue where the kickoff launch party is, you don't want to miss it. And if you're one of my devout fans who really, really, really be going to some of the live tapings and things I do, of course you're going to be invited. I will not forget you. You know, some of y'all know who y'all are. I will not forget you. You're definitely going to be there. Okay. Um, clear your calendars. Tuesday, February 21st, 2023. That's the kickoff launch. It's the day the book comes out. And then everywhere else, West Coast, I'm going to see you in Cali. I, oop. Oh, I told one of the cities. Oops. All right. That's enough. You're going to see me some places. <laughs> All right. Moving on to the topics. Uh, midterms. Midterms. This is the final week, y'all. The final week. I know people talk about Halloween and shit. Ah. Uh. All right, you know, listen, I'm not really a Halloween person. I didn't really do anything Halloween y this year, to be honest. I, I just kind of just chilled. I will say this about Halloween. Halloween. I think people just use it as a way to just, you know, these costumes, some of these costumes are creative. I'm going to say this. I am not impressed or excited about celebrities who do Halloween because y'all got money and y'all have like all these like resources. And honestly, you know, eh, eh. I'm never excited about Halloween from celebrities, but I love to see everyday people uh, do Halloween, like come up with creative things. So that's great. Um, my, I guess my only Halloween thing I did this year that was very Halloween-ish was like, I had watched Hocus Pocus 1 and 2 back to back. And I loved it. I liked the Hocus Pocus 2 sequel. Now, Bette, Mib Nib Bette Nibbler, uh, Bette Midler being a turf, that was kind of disappointing. Um, not in the film, but just in general. That just really was like a, uh. But the movie itself was fun. Um, Sarah Jessica Parker, I'm like, she's still playing that character. Anyway, lots of, uh... You know, look, it's Hollywood. People do Botox. People do what they got to do. All I got to say is it was very clear. Folks had to maintain. This film is... The, the original Hocus Pocus came out in 1993, which was like nearly 30 years ago. And the fact that they took it took over 30 years to have a sequel is wild. And they literally look the same for the most part. And was very energized. It's, it's just wild. Like, Hollywood could do anything. Like, the fact that they brought them together... Nearly 30 years later to film the sequel. That's, that's, I mean, that's just wild. That's just, 
but the passion, right? People really will, will hold on. Like I grew up on Hocus Pocus. I was two years old when Hocus Pocus came out originally. But when I was little, it used to come on the Disney Channel all the time. So it was always like a cult classic. It is a quintessential cult classic. So I'm always going to be speaking up uh, the film. I, I saw the sequel. Love the sequel. Love what they did with it. Very diverse cast. Love the storyline. Love the narrative. They did a really good job. Disney did a good job with Hocus Pocus 2. As far as like how they made it hip and modern. They appreciate the last one. They It was just very good. They did a really good job. I, I personally enjoyed it. Um... I like watching them both back to back. So if you have Disney Plus, I would recommend watching them both back to back, back to back. Um, and I did that, and I I really did like it. I, I had fun with it. I'll put a spell on you. That whole dance sequence thing is one of the best musical sequences in a film for me. For me, my taste. I mean, I love musicals and things, but I just love the. I put a spell. That whole, yeah, yeah. I've had dreams that like. We were going to do like, um, you know, uh, Hocus Pocus. I I, I really want to do it. I wouldn't be Ren and Fred and, and have my friends be the Sa the sisters, the Sanderson sisters. But the Lit Brothers are four. But, you know, I, I you know, I think that that's the reality. Um, so I, I can I can see all of the critiques and angles around that. But anyway, we're talking about midterms. Final week, y'all. Final week. At this point, vote. Just fucking vote. I don't got time to hear people with the whole who won the fucking debate. Let's just keep it 100. <sighs> a raise of hands if you thought that a debate changed your perspective on who you was going to vote for in this particular race. I thought so. I don't know why we have these conversations. About who won the debate. Or if the debate, like, oh, what you thought about the debate. So, I don't know. Did you think watching the debate that no matter what Dr. Oz was going to say, that you were going to be conveyed or persuaded into voting for him? Let's be real here, y'all. Nobody was has over the past... Listen, I'm going to say this, and I don't care who feels what they feel about it. Since 2012... Between Obama and Romney, that was the last time we ever had an election where both of the candidates had the ability to move you in a way that did not make you feel like you was going anarchist or, uh, you know, complete debauchery. I mean, progress. I don't know. It's never been, it stopped being as polarized. After them, it went completely polarizing. Because in 2016, we were between Trump and Hillary. And I don't, I mean, where I stood on it. Personally, there was nothing that Hillary was going to say in that debate that was going to ever make me vote, not vote for her compared to Trump. It just wasn't going to happen. 2020, here we go again. Biden, Trump. What was there going, what could Biden say that would have made me go for Trump? Nothing. It just wasn't going to happen. So here we are in the midterms. We are in the primary, right? I'm not primary. The We're in Pennsylvania right now. I keep, I'm thinking. I'll get to why I say what I said about mayors. We're in the general. We're in the midterms. And the race is between Fetterman and Oz for Senate. There is nothing that Oz said that day, that night, or during that debate, that would have ever made me think that he was electable, decent, or should be considered. The debate was just an optic. The debate was just a necessary procedure. I, I don't know why people care. The debate is stupid. I will tell people that, listen, Fetterman did suffer a stroke. That's clear. We all know this. But I want people to understand that the, that his stroke did not impede upon his mental ability to think or to, to be progressive. It's impaired his speech right now, his process to retain and read. But that has not stopped his actual cognitive ability to be effective. And a lot of ableism... Is, is shaping how people are thinking about this and talking about this. And that's kind of fucked up. And, and it's just disgusting. It's very gross. I, from both sides. I've seen articles. I'm just like, you guys, this is not the range. You don't even understand how health works. Or how about you educate yourself? I did. I educated myself. I, I know people who've suffered a stroke. And and there's people who have told me, like, listen, when you, when you deal with something like that, it, it, it could change 
you know, the first process, it can, it can do things, but that doesn't stop your actual health. The doctor has said that he is fine to be able to participate. He took a break, you know, at one point in time because he had that, but like, he's not like, there's nothing physically impairing his ability to do the job. Like, it's not that, like, it's simply Okay, he has to read, uh, you know, closed caption so he can be able to catch up with the reading of things. That's okay. That doesn't mean that, you know, you you know, there's a mental shift and he's now not able to remember anything. He's not having a, a cognitive issue in that way. That's not what the issue is here. And so there are people who just don't understand how this works. It's not like, it's just, it's just, no, it's not like he had a, a whole coma and it was a brain coma and it was a, you know, foggy memory. It's none of that. Like if you, I, I've seen him since his stroke. I've met him personally, directly. I have seen him at events and rallies and events. He's, he's good. Y'all, he's fine. It, 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 he's really fine. Like his, there, there's nothing there. And it, and if it was or something was really wrong, I would, I would not lie. And so I just really hate the, the see people who just don't understand how this works or understand what's happening here buy into a lot of the ignorance. And for Dr. Oz to sit up and berate this man, and he calls himself a doctor, but you're berating someone who have had, a, you know what the issues are, and you're mocking, you're being conning. Like, this man is just, get this man the fuck out of here. Y'all, November 8th, send this motherfucker back to Jersey, where he belongs. Okay? Send him back to Jersey. Send Oz packing. He's got to go. Okay, this is this is going on for too far and people keep trying to entertain it and it's sad. I think Fetterman's gonna win. I I I hope he does. I really do. Um there's just been a lot of speculation. The race is they're saying it's close. But these polls have been a little weird um because of how skewed they are. Um and also just some of the just general polls. It's like, okay, you're just putting percentage numbers up. Where did you get it from? It's just it's getting weird. Um, but at the end of the day, I just think everybody just need to make sure they're going to the polls and do what they need to do. Period. That's it. That's it. At this point, do what you got to do. Go vote. And the Democrats have been big out here. They've been out here in these streets making sure they they get people fired up and ready to go. So one of those events was, I mean, first of all, let me just say statewide, I mean, countrywide, you got Chuck Schumer out here talking hot mic, okay, saying some stuff. Talking about Herschel and Fetterman and stuff. He says that basically he thinks Fetterman is fine, but he was talking about he worried about Herschel over there with uh with Reverend Raphael Warnock. I was like, ooh. Georgia, Georgia is I, I don't know about Georgia, y'all. I don't want to say that out there, but Georgia, if you are in Atlanta, if you are in Georgia, listen to my podcast and you have not voted, um, you need to fix that. But by but but I'll say this Obama has been going out. Okay, he was in Wisconsin, Mandela Barnes. I hope that can happen. Uh, you know, it was a big deal. He's been out. Obama, they had to pull Obama. You know, one would argue that they should have been a little bit like this past, this whole October. They should have been hitting the ground heavier this whole October. They should have not waited so close. But I don't know if they just thought that momentum would have been lost. So they just decided to put all the pressure in the final week because that's really going to drive the voters and get people fired up. I'm, I'm curious how this strategy is going to play out, to be honest. Um, because, you know, conventional wisdom would tell, would, would say that this, that people should be fired up and amped up in the, in the month, but Democrats play different games. I don't know what the fuck is wrong with the democratic party sometimes, but that's another conversation I'm going to have after November 8th, but I have some thoughts, but I, I want to, I, I really just want everyone to just make sure they vote and do what they got to do. Vote correctly. I'll say, but let me say this about, the dinner. There was an the third annual independence dinner. The, the state Democratic Party, uh, the Pennsylvania Democratic Party, had the dinner at the Pennsylvania Convention Center in Philadelphia. I was there. Okay. Only black journalist. Only black journalist that was at that dinner on Friday. While everybody was dealing with the Phillies or seeing Nicki Minaj, you know, look like a cozy couch girl doing a little leg split or whatever on the powerhouse stage. What is she? I'm not even going to talk about Nikki today. Whatever that was she was doing, I don't know. But y'all was at Powerhouse. Y'all was at the Phillies games. Y'all are everywhere but where y'all need to be. I was there. White reporters, TV people were there. 
but there were no black journalists in the building. I was the only one, and I'm not happy about it. And uh, let me tell you something. I will tell you all that I let them know that this was not okay. And I demanded to have the access to be able to be able to cover and make sure I have my credentials. The, the, I just was not about to play those games. It was wild that 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 event was did not have it in a city with this much black and brown people. There should have been more black journalists there. And I am, am making a point as the president of the Philadelphia Association of Black Journalists. I try not to tell these staff people their how to do their jobs, but it, it just it baffled me because I I felt like oh I don't have to check in and see if there's black journalists that they have reached out to. But I will promise you this. Any of these events, these big, huge press events with these politicians, I, when these press secretaries contact me and send invites and things, I am going to ask them, who black is going to be there? If you don't know a black journalist, let me find you one. I know several political black reporters or people that can, that can help do this job. We're not doing this anymore. Why does this keep happening? If you're trying to make sure voters are engaged, black press, black and brown media needs to be there. I just, that just is a pet peeve of mine. I don't like it. And it pisses me off. And you should be pissed off as members of, of our society. Because th that just, that shit can't keep happening. All this, well, we want to go to mainstream outlets. I don't give a fuck where you're going. You need to have black journalists in the room. You need to have Latinx journalists and Asian journalists. Like It's just, it's just, this is not okay. The president of the United States, the president and vice president of the United States was in Philadelphia. And I was the only black journalist that was there. It's not okay. Not okay. So I was there. And y'all know I have to represent. Y'all know I had to be. Look, I don't walk out without something, says Denzel Washington when he's referring to the Oscars. <laughs> uh, he said that to Jamie Foxx. It's true, though. I ain't walking out without nothing. Um, I got there. Um, and it was good. I got a lot of information. See, let me tell y'all about these events. There, It was a dinner, chicken dinner. It wasn't good. I didn't really eat anything. I just looked at what people had because I was going to Gabriella's vet, Vietnam. This is, uh, this is at, uh, this is on Friday night. So I didn't eat dinner. My plan was to go do this event and then go to dinner, which I was able to make it to on time. Everything worked out. Gabriella's vet, Vietnam is, um... In East Pashunk. So it wasn't that far from everything else I need to go to and do. So that was a blessing. But let me tell y'all. The kind of... The things that I have to put up with. Okay. Um, the things that I have to put... The, the things that I have to put up with. Is, is just been beyond me. Because... Um, you know. It, it was just very... Telling. About some of the things that happened now you know um for starters you know um which was very telling for starters i was observing who was there and who wasn't there so here were the people that was there and i'm going to say who was not there so this was really state party so the of course the state chair of the Democratic Party of Pennsylvania is the current new chair is Sharif Street. Sharif Street was there and he noted and wanted us to know that this is the biggest, most single successful fundraiser in their history. Really impressive. There's been a lot of money coming into Pennsylvania and he is taking that credit under his leadership. Now, what I will also add is that just a little sidebar about debates. Well, I'll get to that in a minute about debates and things, but it's it's a big deal because the interesting thing was that, you know, behind the scenes, there was a fight. They did not want Sharif Street to have that position. There were many leaders in the party who did not want him to have that position. What I was hearing was, was that Shapiro was pushing for a guy from Montgomery County to be the chair, this white man named Jerry. And they had this slate that had Malcolm Kenyatta and some other people on the slate. Now, this was competing in this state race that was happening. Now, I talked about this back in the summer This when there was this, this fight around this seat and the seat that was going on with Sharif Street trying to get that position. Now, Sharif is always trying to get a position because remember, he was trying to go for the U.S. Senate at one point in time. And then he didn't do it. And Malcolm Kenyatta upsurted him. 
to to shoot his shot for that position. So it was a lot of behind the scenes backstab stabbing across the board, many cuts across the board. But in particular, there was arguments and allegations that there was a racial slant. Now, I don't know how I feel about that because I feel like sometimes it's funny how certain elected officials like Sharif Street and others like to talk about racism and these things when it's something happening to them, but they seem not to align themselves with activists and progressive voices that speak to these various these various issues and align themselves with the politics that will help those people. So I, I, I'm not going to play into the entertaining of that there was this racism around it. Now, there could have been some bias. There could have been some of that. Maybe. Who knows? Maybe there was some subtleties there. But I just think that it's funny how these politicians like to play into talking about the racism when it impacts them in this political system, but they don't have this empathy when we're talking about policing and other racial injustices. Just saying it's just very interesting when when they want to be black. Anyway, um, so <laughs> I, I, I knew coming in that there was some heat, and I was trying to figure out what this is because, okay, Sharif got the position. So then it was like, okay, is Shapiro and him, what's that relationship looking like? Because if Shapiro is going to be the next governor, which it looks like he's going to get it, y'all, the polls say that Doug Mastriano is not going to win right now. That's what they're saying. Then what does that relationship look like between the party chair, the state party leader, and the gov- the future governor? Like, it's just a little messy. It's a little messy. So... He was there. His wife was there. His communications director was there named Desmond. Desmond is a very great guy. Shout out to Desmond. I just have to give him a shout out. He's a communications director. That guy looks out for black media and people. I will give him his props. Shout out to Desmond. If you if you see Desmond out there, McKinson, I think his last name is, but his communications director, Sharif's communications director, that guy deserves a raise, a promotion, whatever. That's a good guy. Just going to give him that shout out. But what I will say about the other issues that's happening they were there. He okay, so so sh- he was there. Governor Wolf was there with with the first lady. Uh, they were there. Shapiro came. Now here's the thing: Shapiro and Austin Davis came, both the gubernatorial uh, and 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 lieutenant gubernatorial candidates. Right now, Shapiro did not stay. He shook hands, but he did not go and speak, which people were surprised about. But he's Jewish, so he had sabad saban, so he had to go and eat, and he got he was family. It's a Jewish traditional on friday some people uh you know recognize the sabbath some people don't he do so he didn't speak that was what he said that's what he claimed now anthony hardy williams was there state senator vincent hughes was there uh philadelphia party leader bob brady was there to which they celebrate the fact this man has been the party leader for over 30 years and he's the longest running party leader currently in the country I don't know why that was a compliment. I don't know why they were celebrating that. I'm going to be quiet. But I just thought that was weird. But he was there. Um, Who else came in leadership? Jordan Harris came. Jordan Harris, y'all, the state rep, the the, the, the party whip or whatever, Joanna McClinton was there. But back to Jordan Harris. Joanna McClinton was there, y'all. She didn't speak to me. I didn't speak to her. She don't like me. Y'all know this already. Jordan's nice. He's cool. Jordan was there. He's engaged to a black woman, which is not a shocker for him. He's a nice man. His fiance is gorgeous. Met her. Lovely woman. She's not from Philly. They got engaged on April 29th. I didn't even know he was engaged. She came down here. Nice woman. She's Pentecostal. She's Kojic. And you know I grew up Kojic. So I was like, <gasps> So we were like talking and telling stories about how like there's no real Pentecostal. There's not a lot of Pentecostals do it differently in Philadelphia. I, you know, I was just, I was flabbergasted. She's beautiful. She's lovely. Very nice woman. Listen. I knew Jordan was being nicer lately and being a nicer person. I was trying to figure out what happened. She's what happened. She's gorgeous. She's nice. And I just hope that they get married and it's a great marriage and that it works and they work because my goodness, what a wonderful woman. She was so sweet. And Austin Davis's wife is a rock star, which if you know anybody from Pittsburgh knows who his wife is, she's a big deal. Um, but you know, it it was just nice to see all this black excellence in, in, in that sense. It was, it was. It was nice to see so much politicalness and promise. Uh, Donna Bullock was there. Otis was there. Yes, Amon Brown was there. I ran up on Amon. Now, no gangster stuff. It's nice. It's it, you know, I asked him some questions and I got some answers. And I asked him. I said, "Listen, this Krasner impeachment stuff is coming. Where do you stand on this? Are you trying to impeach Krasner? What you trying to do?" He said to me verbatim that he will not be voting to impeach Krasner. He did the committee. The committee was a joke. I told him it was a flop. 
They dissolve, they dissolve because now the House Republicans are going to take over. We'll get more to that in a minute. But he basically said that he is not going to vote to impeach Krasner. I know for y'all, that's not going to take y'all off the hook on how some of y'all feel about him. I just wanted to have that clarity for myself because I was hearing some things. Also, there's rumors that he might be running for mayor. He says that's not happening, but there's been a lot of money raised for him behind the scenes. But we're going to get to some more of that later on in this conversation. There was a lot of tea being spilled. I saw, uh, who else was there from the state, the level? Jason Dawkins and Morgan Cephas. <laughs> no, I didn't mean to say they as they're a couple. <laughs> I meant to say in order. She was there, he was there. Did I say they were there together? Mm. Um, who else was there from the state? Uh, that was a big deal. I think that was all the big players. Oh, Senator Anthony Williams. Say Senator Anthony Williams, who I said already, he was there. Um, those are like the major players. I, I can't think of anybody else. Those are like the big players. Now, s mayor, city council, uh, mayoral candidates or likely mayoral candidates were there. Alan Dom, Derek Green, um, Sherelle Parker was there. And Rebecca, and, and I'm, 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 I'm going to save who's not there in a minute. I want to focus on who was there. Derek Green, Alan Dom, um, Cheryl Parker were there. Uh, City Council, Ben Waxman, who, who's going to be replacing Brian Sims, was there. Um, he's gonna he's the guy who 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 ran in that district in the neighborhood district who's ran before against Brian Sims. Brian Sims did not run for re-election. Ben Waxman came and took it. So he was there. Rue Landau's there, who of course, as you all know, is the former Philadelphia Commissioner of Human Relations uh executive director. She's a lesbian, openly gay. Mark Siegel, who was also there, who is the publisher of Philadelphia Gay News, he's been pushing Rue about wanting a gay city council member because there has been no openly gay city council member in office. Now, if you're talking about John Anderson, listen, he is, you know, many people knew him to be gay. He was not out when he was serving. It was not public. That that doesn't, you know, people don't count that in openly. So there's an important detail to know because sometimes people just like, like the out people and stuff. Don't do that. Okay. You know, understand the timeline history. So they want Rue. Apparently people want Rue. I met Rue, spoke to Rue. I've known Rue before. Rue and I did a lot of communications when she was in her executive director position and was dealing with gay racism. Now, when Rue left that position and I stopped covering those issues as much, she kind of got a little funny, in my opinion, towards me. And that was because she was close to Amber Hikes, who y'all know I can't stand. And apparently a lot of people can't stand her now. Well, look how history told that story. But she was really, you know, playing both sides and stuff. And honestly, when I really departed from really getting involved in gay people politics and covering it as much, it was those types of backstabbings and like shady business that was happening with some of these people that made me just kind of be like, I'm off of y'all because you know who I am and y'all being fake. So I I do think more conversations are in line if she wants to talk to me. She should to be friendly to me. She didn't tell me she was running for office, let me be clear, but... I mean, everybody knows, and she was trying to be nice because she knows that, you know, look where I'm at today. See, that's why you got to be careful about who you who you be mean to and be funny with, because you just never know where people land or where they end up, right? So she was there. Um, Jonathan Hankins, they call him Mr. Philadelphia. <laughs> he was there. Um, he's running for city council at large. Well, that's what he declared. Let me just be clear. That's what he declared publicly, but things could change. Who knows? Not going to get into that conversation. Um... Who else was worthy that was there? Oh, Jamie Gautier was there. She didn't speak to me. I don't think she saw me. Her shoes with her sister, Samantha Williams. The relationship has been really weird. But let me say what the shady thing she did. So my husband. So as y'all know, background story, me and Gautier used to be cool. And Samantha as well. I don't have any issues with Samantha. I don't. Gautier has an issue with me. I don't know if I have an issue with her anymore. I, I just think, you know, hey, I have a disagreement with the fact that she got money from Sean King. That was just not cool. Right? Rather than just apologize and be a decent person, she continues to keep the beef. She unfriended me. I didn't unfriend her. She felt some type of way. It was what it was. But <clears throat> something shady she did recently. So background story, when we had that followed out, I uninvited her and Samantha to my wedding. Well, first of all, I had every issue with Samantha. But my thing is, if that's your sister and y'all were coming together, I can't like invite one sibling, not the other. That's messy. And also, Samantha wasn't going to do it. She knew she got to stick with her sister. She's going to always be Loyal to her sister, and that's what you're supposed to be with family. I get it. So the crazy thing about it was that I invited them. They know who, who they know who my husband is. Why Gautier saw my husband at an event recently, went up to him, was like, oh, hi, what's your name? Like, she didn't know who he was. See, that's that kind of shit. See, that's the shit. That's the Hollywood shit. But when she see me, she avoids me like the plague, okay? 
I'm going to see. I'm going to be at election doing relish. I'm going to see if she's going to say something to me. Some of y'all messy ass listen to this podcast, but I'm going to go back and say something. I don't care. Let her listen to it. I'm around. I'm not going anywhere. My whole thing is, at the end of the day, don't be shady like that. That is shady. He look alike now. You know who I am. I'm about to play these games. He, you know, introduced himself. But, like, he was just like, you really about to act like you're... Whatever. That's funny. Um, but she was there. Uh, Sheriff Rochelle Bilal was there. <laughs> she was there. Um, Tracy Gordon was there. Um, and Tracy Gordon is the... Uh, Register Will, she was there. So here's who was not there in ranking order. Because who spoke at the event, to be clear, was Jamie Harrison, who's the party chair of the National Democratic Party. He was there. He spoke. Uh, Anthony Hardy Williams spoke. Austin Davis spoke. Fetterman spoke. Great speech from Fetterman. And what's interesting, real quick, about Fetterman was that even though people thought that debate he lost because of the way he was speaking, or some people thought that way, he raised $2 million within like the first 12 hours since the speech. So who's really winning? Um, Kamala, VP Kamala Harris spoke and Biden spoke. Yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a very, oh, and Sharif Shreef spoke, of course. It was a very lit party. It was a lot of, it was a very lit party. Um, Sophia Bush was there, the actress. Now, who was not there? And this is a standout. Kenny, Mayor Kenny was not there. Weird. Um, Mayor Kenny was not there. Malcolm Kenyatta was not there, y'all. And I'm going to tell you what I think. I don't think he, I mean, he may have been invited. I don't think he was wanted there. It's been some interesting stuff. Sharif, that's Sharif country right there. That's Sharif country. I don't think that Malcolm wanted to be in the same room where Sharif Street was in the same room. I think that the betrayal between, the betrayal that happened between them two was strong. And so Malcolm, I just knew Malcolm was going to be there because Mr. Man liked to have his own little media parade. I think there's some some bad blood that's still lingering between those men and between the party with him. I, I don't know. It's just been really weird. They, it's been some weirdness going on over there, but they've really been distancing him. Um, Who else was not there that stood out? Um, Connor Lamb wasn't there. I mean, I just feel like I would assume that because this is a state party, everybody should be coming together uniting. I don't know if Dwight Evans was there or not, or he was just being low key. I couldn't recall. Um, Helen Gim was not there, um, which was very telling within itself. Um, Rebecca Reinhardt was not there. Uh, and she just announced she's running for mayor. So we knew that was coming. She was not there. Maria Quinoa Sanchez was not there. Um, yeah, those were the big ones that stood out to me. Um, given the the weight of this event, they weren't there. I mean, maybe they were at the Phillies game. I don't know, but that just stood out to me. So, how did I go get to see Kamala? I won't tell you how I saw Kamala. I will reserve that story for my friends. But all I gotta say is there was some haters in that house, and somebody looked out for me and got me to that table. That table was the table where Sharif Street was sitting at. Bob Brady sat at, Vincent Hughes sat at, Kamala sat at, and somebody's consultant or leader or whatever. That was a heavy political table. They got me to the front when she spoke. I saw her speak front row. Not bad speech. You know, very compelling. And I, I will never take away Kamala's oratorical talents. She's a great speaker. She's she's good at what she do. Her politics and I sometimes have their moments, and clearly the K-Hive will, will remind me of such. But wasn't it fun? To take that picture and to let the K Hive melt on Twitter. That was the fun part. Listen, I took my picture and I dipped, okay? I did not wait. You didn't have to tell me twice. I zipped my ass up out of there. Oh, other people from city council. Kenyatta Johnson was not there. But Isaiah Thomas wasn't there either. Interesting. But Kathleen Gilmore Richardson was there. Just more people I'm just remembering who was there who wasn't there. Very, very telling. Um, but long story short, I got my picture. I saw her. I shook her hand. I said hello. I'm not going to get into the rest of the in, in, in the situation, but I got my photo. And to the friends that are listening to this, we'll have that conversation at dinner or drinks, y'all, because you know, you know. But this is the pocket. Listen, listen. I ain't got I ain't got time for Secret Service to be over here. Okay. I saw her. I got a photo. The photo's real. The experience is real. And I want you to look at the back of the table who's in the, who was at that table. That's what makes it funny. 
in the back drinking a sipping a drink was 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 Brady. Okay, that's power. This black queer man who have told this these people to sit back, resign, whatever, found a way to get in there and get his. Listen, I just Isaiah. You know, fifty four verse seventeen. That's all I'm gonna say on it. You know. Um, Doc Ayla Stanford was there and we had like a little personal photo shoot and I know y'all about to tease me because I was just talking about photos last time. Listen, it was not me who asked to take all those shots. It was Dr. Ayla Stanford. I'm going to blame my girl Stanford. Congratulations on one year of the, of the center because that's powerful. But it was her who wanted multiple shots and then we made a cute little collage together and it was cute because we gave y'all professional, casual and goofy. But it was not me asking for all those shots. I look good. I came in there with the go-to feezy. And my cute little ghost shoes. I was cute. I looked nice. It was a nice night. So, that's all I'm going to say. We're going to see what this last week going to give. But you all know I'll be at Relish doing the live broadcasting um, in the Northwest at Relish. November 8th, Ryan Boyer, you know me, the laborers, special, election special, co-hosted by yours truly, myself, Mr. Ernest Thomas. I'll be there. I'll be, you know, talking to the candidates It'll be election day. It's gonna be tight, just like we did the primary. We do this every. We do this twice a year. We do it every primary, and it's always a good time. Relish with the buffet, all the politicos, and now we're gonna have all these mayoral candidate interests. It's about to be very, very lit. Okay, I just gotta say that. I just have to say it's about to get super lit over here. Um, but we'll talk more about that in next week's episode. Um, so other things before I get into it, because I want to talk about the mayoral's race and some of the other messes going on, because I got some tea over there. Um. Nancy Pelosi's husband being attacked. Listen, I don't know what y'all don't know. I have no inside scoop. There's conspiracy theories out there. There's the streets. The streets are talking. All I can say, all I know, as they say in, in Philly, is that he was at his house. There was a man, I guess, with a weapon. They found the man. The man has a history of being a, a, a election denier, a bigot, mega, all of that. Um... Came in there, I guess, with a hammer, attacked this man or whatever, was looking for Nancy. I mean, this is a big deal. And the fact that it has not been, I mean, there's been media coverage, but the fact that everyone's just like, I don't know. It's just, it's just interesting how the media is not prioritizing as much as I think they should. Just saying. I, I just find this to be very interesting. Uh, we'll see what happens. I mean, they better bury that man, throw that man under the jail. I mean, that's just ridiculous. I mean, what the fuck? And, it, and there's rumors about, you know, connections and, and who influenced him to do it. Look, we'll see. But that shit is uh, okay. So my thoughts and prayers go out to... I know I think he got a full recovery. He's going to be okay. But, you know, that's that's just, that's just a lot. Moving along. Krasner's impeachment updates. So there's a lot of y'all has been asking about the Krasner impeachment stuff. Here's what I know. It's gotten really weird. And a lot of stuff is getting convoluted. So... What I will say is that there was a committee, right, that was led by two Democrats and another Republican, I believe, looking into this. This was uh, State Rep Burgos, who is Black and Latino in Philadelphia, Burgos. And then there was, of course, Armin Brown, the State Rep in West Philly. Now, they were on this committee to to, to basically see what was going on between, um, you know, looking to Krasner. Um, now, this is Republican-led. These Republicans, you know, Danilio Burgos is a Democrat. Um, Amin Brown is a Democrat. And I'll just tell you that they be playing fire with these Republicans. I don't play with Republicans. I don't play with, I don't, I don't really play with any of these type of people. But everybody's out here, you know, playing politics and, and playing these types of games. And I don't, you know, you know, you, 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 you play with the clown, the clown comes back to bite. You fool around with clownery, the clown comes back to bite. I, I'm not impressed with it. But they had this committee to look into it. They had these hearings. Their hearings were whack. They were weak. They were stupid. And essentially, I think that there's like no real recommendation from that committee to really basically impeach Krasner. Well, the, they, the, 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 it got dismantled. Um, the Martina, who, Martina White, who used to be the, the chair of the Republican Party of Philadelphia, She's a state rep. She's based in Philadelphia. She's now trying to bring about articles of impeachment. There's only a couple of days left from the House uh, this year. And they're trying to extend it to pursue this, this impeachment. 
There's enough votes to impeach Krasner. Impeaching Krasner does not mean it's the end of the world. There's just enough votes to impeach him, which means there will be a hearing and there'll be almost more drama and theater. And honestly, the debate is that is there enough time to even impeach him formally before the session is over? That's the debate. Um, but as of right now, they're just trying to go through with it. Um, I predict that he will get impeached. Um, but however, once it goes to the Senate, the Senate has to have a two-thirds vote to convict him. And if they convict him, then he'll be stripped of his seat. In Pennsylvania state history, there's only been one person removed in this type of way. And that was back in 1994 um, with one individual who wasn't even like a state rep or anything, but he had another position. He was doing some unethical things and he got removed. And that was in 20, I mean, that was in 1994. So it's been over 25 years ago. So it's it's been it's been a while. It's been it's been a while since this has happened, but that's the first time it's happened then. Krasner would be the second if they was to succeed. I, I don't think they will. I think they'll be able to impeach him. But like I tell you all, there's been many presidents that's been impeached. Trump was impeached twice. It's the conviction that makes the mark, right? Like, you know, Bill Clinton has been impeached, but it's the conviction. The conviction. Um, so if he gets convicted, he gets removed out the seat. He would have to have a two-thirds vote. He would need five Democrats to flip in the Senate. I don't know who's going to do it. I don't see the five. I know there are some that will do it, but I don't know the five that would do it. I don't know the five. I think there are some who will, but I don't know the. I don't see the five that will, will, will buy into it and do it. So I think he'll be safe because of that. So we'll see. But as of right now, I don't think they have the votes. And so... The conviction is going to probably not happen. But the impeachment alone is a mess because it's going to be more taxpayers' dollars going into the legal, the legality of this. It's just so much resources wasted. This is so stupid. This man was duly elected. Like, what are we doing? He was duly elected. It, 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 you got to respect the process. He's He's there. And all this blaming him for gun violence. When I read the report from that commission on restoring law and order or whatever, they acknowledged in the damn report that all of these things could not fall within Krasner because there was other structural issues and things that, and environmental things that led to some of these issues. Like, that's what they said out there on goddamn mouth. So I don't know why everyone's trying to act like there's this, like, mass conspiracy. I mean, it's just not there, y'all. Just <laughs> let it go. So that's why I stand on it personally. I don't I don't think it will it will happen, but we'll see, right? We'll see. And it's so funny how convenient they're doing this politically. Like all this before the week of the goddamn uh, um, you know, midterms. It's just nasty work. Um now, Philly mayoral race. Okay, it's heating up, y'all, and it's only gonna get hotter. Um, I have done my research. I have talked to some close sources, some people up front. Won't get into names because you know a lot of this stuff is, you know, on background, but you know, I know what I know. So Here's what I've been hearing, and here's what I know. Now, we know Sherelle Parker's in the race. We know Derek Green's in the race. We know Rebecca Reinhart is in the race. We know Maria Canela Sanchez is in the race. That's it, right? Right. Rebecca Reinhart, Derek Green, Maria. Yeah. Sherelle. Yeah, four. However... What I have heard is that Alan Don will be running. It will be coming. I thought he was going to sit this one out. It, it looks like he's going to run. He's going to wait till the uh, the midterms are over to seize the opportunity. I've heard Jeff Brown's going to do it as well. That's like really going to happen, um, which is wild. And I also heard that Helen Gim is going to do it. And the issue is that Helen Gim is waiting because apparently Fetterman's campaign team are, I guess, going to be the same people that's going to transfer to Helen Kim. I will be devastated if that happens because I really like Fetterman and I like his team. But if they get behind Helen Kim, it's Helen Kim is no Fetterman and Fetterman is not Helen. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I love Fetterman's campaign team. Some of the people that's there, there's some great people. I just can, I don't think they understand, I I don't know, I don't know, I, I won't say a lot on that, but I've heard, allegedly, 
Okay, allegedly. Not that it's a crime. I mean, I'm not accusing him of crime. But what I've heard from my sources is, guys, I say allegedly. It's not a crime. But what I've heard is that they're, 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 you know, that her race potentially is held up by, you know, whatever happens with Fetterman. Because people are like, well, if there's a runoff or something happens, she can't move yet until, until all that gets straightened out. So she's tied up with the with the with the November uh, situation. That's that's what I'm hearing. That basically they're going to convert over to her campaign, but they have to get John in there. So that's what I'm hearing about it. But it looks like she's going to do it. Interesting. Maybe she won't. Who knows? We'll see what happens in November. Be honest. November about to be lit. November's about to be lit, okay? We'll see. We'll see. Okay, so Kanye West. Look, he fucked around, he found out. This week has been just another cycle, Kanye. But, you know, I will say that he's hitting, he's hit rock bottom, y'all. I mean, it, it's just like they took everything from him. He's no longer a billionaire, but Diddy became a billionaire. So we're just replacing one billionaire with another billionaire. Uh, Adidas did did depart, and a lot of other people have definitely been following and dropping him. He's been on an apology tour now, even tried to apologize to the black community, y'all. But them apologies to us has been trash. I mean, the stuff he is saying, I'm just like, shut up. Shut up. Just stop talking. He said after he lost his Adidas deal, he knew what it felt like to... Have someone have their foot on his neck. Shut the fuck up. Like, if this man... Why? Why do y'all keep letting him talk? Why do y'all keep giving him a mic? Go the fuck away. I, I just cannot tell you how annoyed... It's like they're really trying to anger us. They're really trying to antagonize black people. Oh, they're in the business of trying to just get us riled up. And I know this. I can say this now because there has now been not one, not two, but three instances where... There's been some double standards. Now, I went viral this week. And, you know, going viral, I'm reminded of the bittersweetness of going viral. Because the sweetness is that you get visibility. People are having conversations. I was in a CNN story. I was all over the timelines. I'm doing interviews. I've been international news. I've been all in the, I've been, I've been out here in the streets. Y'all, y'all know, right? I mean, over 67,000 thousand likes. I mean, it's wild. It's one of my most viral tweets ever. And I just made a point. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes, you know, I just give it to people plain. It, it, it's not all of this extra, you know, you know, fancy language. Sometimes it's just giving the people the information. Giving the people what's real. Not cherry coding shit. Just giving the people the goods. And, and and I keep it 100, right? I just, I have no other choice but to. And so Twitter has been, you know, it, it's been a lot of people showing love. So my tweet I said was, fact, before Kanye West was quote unquote the face of anti-Semitism, he was one of the hip hop faces of misogynoir, anti-blackness, Trumpism, and slavery denial. And y'all still gave him contracts, documentaries, endorsements, clothing deals, and millions that became billions. Shame. Simple, y'all. Simple. And it went viral. It went viral. Over 70,000 likes. Over 70,000 likes. 70,000 people. Massive. Massive. And, and, And those are the moments where I'm just like, this is why I do what I do. Because I've been saying this for a while, and I'm now that cranky person now that y'all can look at and say, oh, look, he going to tell us how. Yes, yes, I am. I'm going to talk my shit because I've been saying this for a while. Okay. Four million impressions, over 165,000 in engagement, over 40,000 profile views connected to this. I'm just saying the impact, the impact, the numbers, the numbers don't lie. Okay. The numbers don't lie. It's the work. It's the business. It's what we do. And we have to have a space where we can have these conversations because that's the work. That's what the work looks like. That's what the work looks like. Um, Making mature shit go viral. 
making smart shit go viral because there's so much dumb shit out there. And we and we let a lot of that get the get the front row seat. We gotta we gotta bring smart back again. But I I I you know the thing about it was interesting was there was so many so the bittersweet the, 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 those are the, the sweet parts the bittersweet part is people that are, have obtuse thinking and are bad faith actors and chaos agents and, and basically you know just want to play devil's advocate want to have bad you know just want to just bring in dumb points and and I've had to be mindful that. I just don't debate. I've been learning this for a long time, y'all. Preserve your energy, preserve pr- preserve your 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 talent and your gifts, please. Because there's a lot of people out here that will just be bad faith actors and do whatever. There were people who tried to argue that, you know, they took the y'all that I was saying in my post as being like I was referring to Jewish people. Why would I be referring to Jewish people? The, y'all clearly society. Am I saying Jewish people gave you those contracts and all those things? Some of them did, but not all of them. I wasn't referring to them. Why did you decide to make that at that point? Why did you decide to file that argument? What's been interesting about white Jewish people, because when I cause see the problem is we keep using the word Jewish people to act like that that that's the totality. That's what Dave Chappelle do. We talk about LGBTQ people. There are there is anti-blackness in the Jewish community. There's anti-blackness in the black community. It's everywhere, right? White Jewish people are always going to take the opportunity. Some of them will take the opportunity to try to find, make something that's critical about racism, a conversation about anti-Semitism. That is problematic. Why is it that when I am criticizing racism and the Jewish community, then all of a sudden there are people that will never be accountable to the facts of the racism and then try to skew it into, into, into something being anti-Semitic. And how is that anti-Semitic? Like, that's not how it works. That's not anti-Semitic. There is nothing critical about... Like, if I'm criticizing racism in the Jewish community, I'm not criticizing Jewish people for being Jewish. Like, are you making... Why are you uh, uh, why are you conflating racism and anti-Semitism together? <laughs> it's that moment where I had that little head, that little head nod, like, do you not see what you're doing here? Like, like how are you, how are you taking this as a shot at Jewish people. Why? Like talking about white privilege? Talking about selective uh, offense? Why are you taking this personal? Your uncomfortableness as a white person, whether you're Jewish or non-Jewish or Christian, your discomfort has nothing about your faith. Your faith actually teaches you to be the opposite. So why would you conflate your faith and your and your religion with your, your anti-blackness? So when I talk about anti-blackness in the Jewish community, how come that is conflated with being anti-Semitic? Hmm? Or are you just a coward or, or are fearful or scared? Because you're erasing the experiences of black Jewish people who have consistently have spoken about anti-blackness within the Jewish faith. Are they anti-Semitic because they're critical about those experiences? Or do you erase them? Because I remember... When I was in the neighborhood, right, and there was neighborhood racism, and I was co- re- reporting on the racism in the LGBTQ community, and there were people trying to say that I was homophobic or transphobic. I was like, how? And they didn't know I was gay. They made assumptions. And I was like, how is this transphobic? Because I'm talking about racism. Because they couldn't say I was homophobic because I was gay, but they were trying to say, oh, it was transphobic. I'm like, how? If you're not racist, why, why are you worried? How is talking about racism in a queer space a homophobic thing? It's not. This is white people that try to weaponize their any type of marginalized experience they have to try to divorce themselves from accountability from the anti-black and racist and problematic shit that they do. I've seen this happen. I've been through this script. Ah, ah, ah. You're not going to do it over here. And I'm giving people right now the words to articulate this because this happens to a lot of people that are tempted to be silenced and criticizing things. We can do two things at the same time. We can acknowledge that anti-Semitism is a disgusting disease. And we can also acknowledge that the anti-blackness that happens in these moments are, is also a disease. I don't understand why we can't keep that same energy. I don't know why I was talking to some people that were Jewish in these conversations and they acted like slavery denial was not as problematic 
problematic as Holocaust denial. They're both as problematic and they should both be treated as such. How are you okay with slavery denial, but you're not okay with Holocaust denial? You should be against the both. The answer is both. It's never this or that. He say, she say. It is literally both. And I'm not going to keep having these one-sided arguments where I'm being told, well, consider these things when I've been considering this shit my entire life. I've been living through various experiences. I have witnessed and have fought against anti-Semitism for many years, and I've been trained. I've gone to Israel. I have informed myself on these issues, and I'm not saying I'm an expert, but what I'm saying is do not talk to me like I am some random ass person on the street. Because the way some of these people talk to black people about these issues, they assume a lot. And I wrote about this two years ago in my piece for Philly Mag about how I learned about racism and anti-Semitism uh, a lot through a trip through Israel and how the intersections of this impacts. And that piece still hits to this day. People are still, thousands of people re-read re it. I shared it on social media and people have re-read it. That has been so many readers, Jewish readers from different backgrounds have told me that that changed their perspective about this conversation. Because we keep hitting the wall every time and it's time to say enough. I'm not acquiescing to one side. I'm fighting for both. Because to me, anti-blackness anywhere is anti-blackness everywhere. There is no such thing as an anti-Semitic society and an anti-black society. There's no such thing as, as a, a, of, of, a, of a progressive black space if you're in a world of anti-Semitism. Of anti, anti because we have multitudes. And I think they want to deny black people nuance. There are black Jewish people. There are black queer people. There are black women. We are in all of these spaces. And, and, and these faiths are not a race in a way that completely denies it. People love to make every other marginalized identity outside of race white by default. Let me say that again. Society loves to make any marginalized group that is not of color white by default. So when people talk about LGBTQ issues, they assume white by default. If they talk about anti-Semitism, they think of white by default. If they talk about ableism, they think white by default. The only time they think about any other race is when they're specifically talking about the race of that community. Latinx people, black people, Asian people. That's the only time when they say, that's not my will, that's my ministry. We are everywhere in these spaces. We are intersecting through all those marginalizations. Y'all need to look up Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw. Y'all need to check out, you know, Moya Bailey. You got to look at these scholars that have been talking about this for years. Do the research, do the reading, and stop asking me for questions. Stop it. Read. The books are there. Google. You knew how to do it during the racial uprisings. Okay, everybody knew how to find book lists and buy books and, and, and wear black shirts and do black boxes. Do that shit here too. Do the homework and stop this. I can tell that y'all are not reading. I can tell I'm trying to have these debates. It's no debate. It's a fucking fact. And you know how I know it's a fact and how I knew there was selectiveness? It's because on three conditions... There was instances over the years where Kanye West was, was talking about how he loved Hitler, was aligning himself with anti-Semitic uh, anti thoughts, and he was saying these things in interviews, and each of these groups was doing it. So years ago, when, when Van Lathan, who I'm, I just love, he's a great, a great thinker, a great intellect, a great media man, was confronting Kanye West on his Slavery Was a Choice comments on TMZ, they late Van said that apparently there was more footage of Kanye saying other problematic anti-Semitic things in addition to the anti-black statements, and that Harvey Levin, who runs TMZ, was they edited it out. And Harvey Levin, I believe, is Jewish or grew up Jewish or whatnot. So they took it out. And they never say anything about it. TMZ has been nothing but consistently putting a camera in Kanye's face, exploiting this situation with Kanye. And I'm just like, but you knew already. And why you act like you did? You had the receipts before everybody else did. Said nothing. Silent. Coward. We find out many years ago, David Letterman, when he had that little show on Netflix, that apparently there was a report that came out that said that Kanye has said various anti-Semitic things there. And also other bigoted things. Now, David Letterman did not run none of those problematic things that Kanye said altogether. But it's just like, you knew, you knew Netflix, you knew, and you still let Kanye have that yay, that, that goddamn yay documentary, right? Like you knew, and you still gave him a platform. Now let's fast forward to a couple of weeks ago. 
you know, when the, when the White Lives Matter shirts happened and Tucker Carlson had Kanye, there were tons of apparently there was footage deleted, well, hidden footage that got leaked where Kanye was saying anti-Semitic stuff in that interview. Tucker Carlson kept the anti-black shit, but did not put the anti-Semitic stuff up. So he was selective again. This is what I'm saying. This is the bias within these people. And I'm not blaming Jewish people for this because it's not their fault. It is the cowardice of white people that like to play these games. They like to pit other communities against each other. And this is not a win or win. We have to all win, all or nothing. And so I'm tired of these conversations. I'm tired of these debates. At the end of the day, kindness is a problem and that's just what it is. And there's no more of this, do you think, do you not? If you care about his mental health, then mental, caring about his mental health means taking him out of exploitative spaces. It's about harm reduction. That's the conversation I'm about. Harm reduction. Are we reducing harm? Period. That's, that's just the bottom line. Speaking of problems, Elon Musk. So Elon Musk is taking over Twitter, y'all. It is... It is wild. People are like, are you going to stay on Twitter, Ernest, or are you not? Look, I'm going to stay on until until I can't stay on. That's how I'm going to put it. I'm going to stay on until I can't stay on. I've already, for the past, everyone since Elon was, was getting in Twitter or Twitter, I have made a point to curate my page in a way that avoids a lot of this ridiculous stuff. I mean, for the most part. I set my, my tweets on comment only. You could only comment on my tweets if I follow you back. Those safety measures are there because I don't want a bunch of crazy people to comment. Now, the quote comments, I can't do anything about quote tweets. But here's the thing. I don't really click and read quote tweets like that. I just don't. I do report. I do block. People do get in DMs, but the DMs keep them hidden. Like, if you're not somebody that I follow, my DMs are not open for me to really see the hateful mail. Now, I make it a point to just delete stuff. But I don't, like I said, I'm creating that for myself. I've been created those those uh, measures. I did that with Instagram and Facebook years ago. Y'all, take advantage of your safety metrics. Stop making your tweets accessible. You don't have to lock your account to stop people from commenting on it. You could just make... My, my profile is public, but I just have created it where I put the feature to let people that only follow comment. It, there are some people that get in my DMs and be like, well, why your comment shut down, coward? Oh, bitch. All that kind of stuff they say. My whole thing is like, and that is exactly why I have not opened my comments because you don't want to actually say anything. You just want to insult. Talk about some, well, 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 I'm entitled. You're, you're not allowing people to have free speech. Shut that. Y'all don't even know how free speech works. I can't wait till y'all read the case for council culture. Free speech, the fact that you got in my DMs and told me this, the fact that you get to say this, you have your fucking free speech. The problem is you want to control and dictate my space, you want to invade my personal space and say whatever you want to me, like you're open to about public forum. It's no public forum. There's no public forum on the internet. I don't believe that. Like you, you don't get to define public forum. Like to me, I don't believe that there's no public forum on the internet because there are no real rules and protections for people collectively online. If anybody can say what they want, there's no consequence of decorum or no agreement that's made, then how can you create a public forum like by general, the internet is by default, it's not a public forum. You have to literally put things in place to create such, and most people are not willing to do that. So therefore, there is no such thing as a public forum on social media or the internet. I don't believe that. That's just my principle. Well, he's been firing everybody so far. He's been firing all the top leadership. Um, they were supposed to get $20 million payouts, apparently, but apparently he did it with, quote unquote, with cause. Um, he's trying everything in his power not to have to pay people in stock transfer to, to, to cash. There's a lot of stuff going on on Twitter right now. We just have to be vigilant and see what happens. But honestly, he said that he's, not that I believe anything this man says, but he's like, he's not bringing Twitter, he's not bringing, Con, not, not Kanye, he says he's not bringing Trump back, apparently, or at least not immediately. We're going to see. We're going to see what's going to happen. But all I got to tell people is, is that if a billionaire was so easy, easily accessible to buying the app in the way he did, that's all you need to know on how fucked up capitalism can be and just also how social media these they're not invested in protecting people or by default they're not that's why i tell people earnestomens.com exists for a reason because if all these apps are acting up you still have to have a platform earnestomens.com is my platform so we'll see like listen shit get real i start i'll, I'll put out a newsletter I, i'll i'll drive people to my page. I'll put my own web videos up and my own stuff on my own page. I mean, I'll do what I got to do if that if it gets to that point. But Twitter's my favorite app and I hope it don't get ruined, but I don't trust this man. So we'll see. But as of right now, I'm going to be on there until, until otherwise, period. 
Moving along, um, Luke Bryan, who is this country singer, this American country singer, he brought out Ron DeSantis in Florida, um, the Republican who's, of course, running for governor for re-election. All I got to say is they was like, oh, my God, they're going to cancel Luke Bryan. Listen, Luke Bryan is not going to cancel. Luke Bryan canceled himself. Listen, you fuck around, you find out. You make decisions. Grown-ups make decisions. He did not have to do it. He decided to do it. He told us what his politics were. Everybody know what Ron DeSantis' problem is. He told us, Luke told us, he aligns with that man. He supports that man. So if that's what you do, then you need to. Then you deserve to lose your gay fans, your country's gay fans. You deserve to lose your female country fans. You deserve to lose the people that just want to hear your music. So that's a choice, and he made it. Leslie Jordan passed away. Oh goodness, what a talent! You know, it's so weird because all of the gay, like, white gay, of all the white gays in, in entertainment, he definitely was a, it was a, was, was for the people. Like, Leslie Jordan was just a godsend. Hilarious, funny. You know, someone was saying, like, you know, Andre Lunsbury passed away not too long ago. Like, why are they, why are they, listen, I, 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 listen, I'm just, it was unfortunate, um, and how he died was sad because an accident. It's just, but he, but he, but he was he he definitely lived a full life. You know, had had so much fun. All his jokes. I went back and watched some of his old stuff. I, I remember the one he did about with Putin talking about Putin, and was implying that Putin was gay. And that was that that shit cracks me up each time I watch that clip. Um, also, some of the he's just hilarious. It's, I think it's the accent. He's short, and it's just like, he's just so funny and adorable. It's just, I don't know, he was just hilarious, and I'm going to really, we're going to, I'm going to miss him. I think he brought a lot of people through the pandemic. I really watched his stuff on the pandemic, during the pandemic, and it was, it was just, a, it was just an escape from all the madness in the world, so it's sad that he's gone, but he lived a great life. So, Taylor Swift's new album is going to slay, y'all. It's going to break records. It's, it's going to be epic. Um... She's expected to have the second highest album, first sales weeks, going to go over Britney Spears, which, by the way, Britney Spears celebrates the 15th anniversary of Blackout this weekend. For all of the Britney fans who have heard Blackout and know about Blackout, it's one of the best albums, one of the best pop albums ever. It's actually, uh, I might say it's my favorite Britney Spears album. That in the zone, in the zone, both of those two, they fight each other. I depend on my mood, but in the zone and blackout are my two favorite, and they were back to back too. And everybody used to talk about the blackout album and say, "Oh, how Britney Spears was so, you know, going through what she was going through." But listen, pressure makes diamonds. She was putting some good, great pop records, okay, on that damn track. That that album was well good, well produced. The cohesion, I really like that album, but. It was good. It sold pretty decently. I mean, it wasn't one of her biggest ones. But, I mean, Give Me More was on there. Break the Ice. Piece of Me. I mean, she had the hits. Even the ones that weren't hits were good. Hot as Ice is a hit to me. It did not necessarily was a single, but it was a hit to me. Okay, that album was... She had fun. Britney had fun with that album. Ooh, they don't make them like that anymore. Um, But yeah, she's, she's dope. Um, But anywho... Taylor Swift's new album, Midnight's. Um, people are getting on it. Billboard says she's going to take over the entire top 10. First time ever a, a pop artist, uh, any artist, has taken over the entire top 10 of the Billboard. I mean, everyone's streaming it. Antihero, Karma, Vigilante shit, Bejeweled, Lavender Haze. Oh, these are all good songs. I love them. I love I love a lot of songs off the album. Karma has just been really uh the, the fact that Karma dropped with everything going on with Kanye right now is just perfect timing. Yeah, I think I don't know. Everyone's like, what's your favorite song off the album? It's so hard. But I'm gonna say my favorite uh, the, the one track that I'll be playing long after this era will be Karma. I just can't get enough of it. It's just perfect. Just it's where I feel right now. It's like everything is karma. For a lot of these, for all these people was talking shit, you know, because Karma is my boyfriend. Karma is a cat. Well, for me, it's a dog. But anyway, Karma is. Listen, it's 
That was the song. That's the standout song for me off the album. But Lavender Haze is, oof, oof. The, the opening, oh, so rich. So rich. I feel I don't know how to sing, but I just, impre- I, I really do. Yeah, I love that album. I, I'm enjoying it. People are, some people are like, I, I can't get into it. Maybe it's not for you. Maybe you don't have the range. Maybe you're not old enough. Maybe you just don't listen to the song writing lyrics anymore. That's, that's like a personal problem. Um, Rihanna is back. Thriller is having a 40th anniversary. It's been 40 years since Thriller came out. Again, I wasn't born then, but I hear people, you know, we celebrate a 40th anniversary of Thriller. Rihanna is back. Okay, lift me up from, listen, I don't care what anybody got to say about this Rihanna song. She is back, bitches. And this is song one of two. There's two Rihanna songs on the, the Wakanda Forever soundtrack. I'm trying to tell y'all this real quick. I just think this was a little teaser, a little warm up. It's a little cute little warm up. It's a little, it, it's cute. It's it's a, it's a lullaby. It's not meant to be a big major league single. I think they just want to give y'all, get y'all warmed up and excited. It's cute. It's nice. It serves a purpose. Okay. I want to see what's next on the menu because B- Rihanna could get an Oscar nomination for best original song. And I don't think there's been any major songs that's come out in the film space that has really are, is going to rise to it. Because let me tell you, Black Panther soundtracks are great. The first soundtrack got nominated for Album of the Year. And SZA, Kendrick and them got nominated for an Oscar for that song. Okay? All the stars. It, listen, they know what they're doing over there. I, the production of this, these albums and these films have been great. I'm excited about Wakanda Forever. I know there was like people talking about how the meet the, the, the promotion was very low key, but it's building and it's building. I've heard good reviews. I'm gonna see a previews very soon. Loved it, okay? Now, I gotta talk about this real quick because people ask me about what I think about what's going on with Chloe from Chloe and Haley. Chloe's solo now. She's doing her thing now. Um, I'm just gonna say this and I'm gonna give for what it's worth. I just think that Chloe, I'm happy Chloe has Beyonce as a mentor. I'm happy that Chloe has these good people in her life. I just think that. What I would like to see from Chloe is the ability to have some creative growth. She needs to have fun. I, the songs she's dropping are good. The song with Lala was cool. Drop the fucking album. Beyonce, listen. You know that we're you was thrown in the water to swim. Every artist needs to go out. Your, your, your freshman album, your first album may not hit the way it's supposed to. That's okay. Sometimes you might get a Sam Smith first album situation. Or you might get a Sierra Goody situation. Or maybe your first album is kind of like, you know, in the in between. You know, it's kind of like, eh, it was all right. You know, that's okay. You may not have an Ashanti, you know, debut album situation. Shout out to her for going in on Irv Gotti with Angie Martinez, by the way. But every but but you gotta get your feet wet. And I feel like people are like Beyonce, I don't know if the team, they're like making her have to do all this, 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 this testing the waters to hit right. It's never gonna be right. Just throw it out and let the fans enjoy it. That's why I respect SZA and 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 um SZA and who else over there? Uh uh Summer Walker and them, because they just put the music out. Just put the music out and get the people excited. Like, like stop playing all these games of trying to be perfect like it don't gotta be perfect just put the music out and get the fans invested and excited in it like let them see it for themselves like we'll like some songs of these first these all these four singles she's dropped have mercy treat me surprise this other song that just came out they're good they're cool like just put out an album because it, the more you wait, the more you're losing momentum. It's been over a year since Have Mercy come out. This whole, like, Normani, I, I've given up on Normani. I love Normani as a person. I, I wish her well. But she's not trying to, I mean, like, it's been over two years since since Motivation and this. All these little singles. I don't know what y'all doing. But, like, in a world with Ari Lennox and these other artists is going at it and going for it, that's what you got to do. It's never going to be perfect. Get your feet in the water and get wet and make it happen. That's just, I'm just, I just feel like I got to get that off my chest. All right. Movies. Um, Till, that new movie is phenomenal. That woman, Danielle, the lead actress who plays Mammy Till in the film. I hope she gets a Best Actress nomination. Whoopi Goldberg was phenomenal in it, surprisingly. I haven't seen Whoopi act this good in the film in years. I mean, remember she was in For Colored Girls. We won't talk about that. Um, It was great. 
And it's not traumatic. It's not trauma porn. There is no violence in the film. You don't see violence. You don't see gore. I didn't want to give it away, but I think this is important to know because a lot of people thought it was going to be trauma porn. They handled this. These black, The black women director, they handled this film and this topic with a lot of sensitivity and, and respect and grace. It was beautiful. A very good touching film. It was. It, it starts... It starts with love. It ends with love. It was beautiful. Watch it. Go see it. Highly recommend it. And lastly, before I conclude, you know, there's going to be a lot of stuff going on. Abbott Elementary Halloween episode was the best. I have, you know, the Bobby, I love you, Bobby finale. We're just, whatever, Bobby. Um, And Lance and Queen Sugar, like I said, I've been holding off on them. People have been having mixed thoughts about these seasons. I am not falling off. I'm just holding them and going to binge watch it all because I just can't keep getting all the suspense. And you know, you know how it goes. This week, as you know, is going to be big, but there's a lot of cool surprises coming up. I'm being honored for a couple of things, but I won't say much until until the next episode. But it's going to be great. I'm going to Dallas. Okay, y'all, I'm going to Dallas, Texas. I'm going to a wedding. Farrah is getting married. My good friend from college, she's getting married. We're going to Dallas over the weekend. It's going to be fun. We're doing traditional wear. It's going to be like, a, I think, an Indian, Pakistani type of wedding vibe. It's going to be fun. And I'm wearing traditional wear. I have to go to a foreign bazaar and get me a piece, Mr. Johnson. So we're going to be serving. Okay, we understand the culture. We get culture. See, that's what I mean about culture. We we, we respect people's culture. We like they, She said you could wear suits and stuff. But I was like, what do y'all wear? What y'all want? Look, I, I, look, I'm all about that. Like, you go, you go and you do what you got to do. What is the customs? I'm down for it. So, y'all, when y'all see our, our traditional wear, you know rock with it so it's gonna be fun but i'm excited this is the final week before the midterms if you are wondering if you should vote or not don't wonder just do and as always be well and be best earnestly speaking is recorded in philadelphia pennsylvania and can be found on apple Podcasts, google Podcasts. to stay up to date with the latest on the show follow me on facebook twitter and instagram at mr ernest owens Use the hashtag Earnestly Speaking to tell me what you thought about this episode and check out my website at ErnestOwens.com.